Hello. Hey, Rabbi. How you doing, Polly? I'm good. I thought I'd join class today. How's that sound like? Fun. Yeah, I'm, good. I'm eating my dinner, so I'm going to mute. <laughs> Fair enough. There you go. Hi. Hey, how you doing? Okay. Happy Passover. Thank you. Thank Happy you. Passover to you, too. All right. Hey, Melissa, how you doing? Good. 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 Having a nice Passover? Yeah. <laughs> a little unusual. It's a little unusual. A little bit. Zooming here and zooming there. You can win Sit closer. Oh, there's Leah. She's on. Very nice. Hello. Hello. Nice to see you. Hi, friends. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi. Somebody back there. I don't think she's going to. I'm putting on right there. Want to wave and say hi? Hi. <laughs> hi, everybody. I see Ray. I see Sandy. Are you having a good day? Debbie Siegel. Hi. Mm, hello, hello, everybody. Are you having a class at 8, Rabbi? Yep. Oh, okay. So she might do the 8 o'clock. What are you doing at 8? Uh, Pure K, I vote. Oh. Yeah, we're going to do a, a new topic since we're getting ready for Shavuot. So we're going to do a little Pirkei Avot. Okay. From holiday to holiday to holiday. <laughs> I see something that says Polly Krauss, Polly, but I don't see I don't see Polly or Polly Krauss. Polly's having dinner, and so she's just going to mute and hang back. Okay. She's going to lurk. Yeah, she's going to lurk a little bit today. <laughs> Okay, I have 7.03, so I think we'll get started. Uh, so, again, Chag Sameach, everybody. Hope everyone's enjoying their Passover. Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach. It's almost over already. It's like hard to believe. You know, we're already on Tuesdays. A couple of days left. I'm running out of matzah. Yeah, I'm running out of matzah, and I don't want to rush to the store. Oh, you see, yeah. <laughs> That's my last, last piece. Oh, no. Yeah, we go on matzah rations here because the kids eat it so quickly. Uh, and so we have to just make sure they don't eat me like a, like a box or two of matzah a day. So wow. Let's make sure that they ask me for permission before they get matzah. That way by day seven, day eight, we still have matzah. Oh. Otherwise, it's matzah all day long. There's certain foods I can't keep in my house, and matzah is one of them. So like matzah, watermelon, cucumbers, you know, this is, these go really fast. And so I tell the kids I don't want to run out to Publix or to whatever it is to keep on buying fruit. You know, they're eating. But it's it. exactly well, right. If they're eating matzo, they need the fruit. That, that, that's the exception. You got it 100% right. That's the exception. <laughs> so, you know, a little more fruit. A little more. <laughs> <laughs> you know, okay. So, today we're going to look at Ezekiel. I'll uh, go back to sort of our prophetic reading, which is nice because the uh, during Passover, during Chol uh, HaMaleh Passover, during the Shabbat, we traditionally read uh, a passage from Ezekiel, Ezekiel and the vision of the dry bones. And so we're going to read that a little bit today together and uh, take a look at that text, sort of flesh it out, no pun intended. Uh, and then, uh, you know, depending on time, we'll go into the next part of Ezekiel uh, as well. And so let's join together in the blessing for Torah study. Okay, and so here we're going to have our good friend Zeke uh, coming up again in a moment. Here he is. Okay, there we go. So Ezekiel, if we remember, uh, is uh, you know prophesying around the time of the Babylonian exile. Uh, so he's about you know, early, 
the late sixth century. Uh, you know, so we're talking about, you know, 590, you know, 600, a little bit, you know, in that area where he is prophesying through perhaps probably middle uh, of that century, uh, you know, 570, 560 uh, BCE. Uh, and as a, a, prod, a prophet, we talk about the fact that he's an ecstatic prophet, that he deals in uh, visions and symbolism and metaphor, and a lot of his stuff is a little bit out there, a little bit extreme, uh, and, you know, a little bit bizarre, uh, certainly about even other the standards of other prophets. And so we're going to look at today is one of his most famous visions, uh, the vision of the dry bones. And so we're going to take a look at this uh, text over here. It's Ezekiel chapter 37. Uh, we're going to begin with verse 1. Uh, David, you, uh, you want to give that a read? Sure. Ezekiel chapter 37, 1 to 14. The hand of the Eternal came upon me. God took me out by the Spirit of the Eternal and set me down in the valley. It was full of bones. God led me all around them. There were very many of them spread over the valley, and they were very dry. God said to me, O oh mortal, can these bones live again? I replied, O oh eternal God, only you know. Okay, right there is great. It's a start. Perfect. And so we see right away, right, it's it's a vision, uh, and it's really like a, it's a moment of transformation. Ezekiel's taken, you know, and, and lifted from where he is and transported down to this valley that's full of bones, right? Uh, and as the name of it suggests, this valley of dry bones, there were a lot of bones, and they were very dry, okay? So they're not lying to you. It's a very, you know, very dry bones and a lot of them. Uh, and so then God turns to Ezekiel. This is also a, um, a common trope in Ezekiel that there are moments where it's like they're talking like they're, they're buddies. You know, you almost picture God standing next to Ezekiel and Ezekiel going, yeah, I don't know, you know, God, hey, what is it? They're having this little conversation, this little tete-a-tete. So God says, can these bones live again? And Ezekiel goes, I don't know. You know, you would know, God, no, not, not me, okay, uh, to see what's going to happen here. And so, of course, we're going to have the bones. Uh, let's see what's going to happen. Oh, Leah, can you see that from there? I can. May I ask you, is this where the gospel song, Dem Bones, Dem Bones, Gonna Rise Again, comes from? Quite possibly. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not as familiar with the gospel song, but it, so okay. it sounds right. It, it sounds like that tracks. So okay. It, it could. I'd have to give that a Google, but with that being said, it doesn't sound far off. I think it's okay. God led me all around them. There were very many of oh, them. Oh, spread. Right, right here. Sorry, I, I got you. Whoa, I got you up sorry. No, that's me. And, and God said to me. <laughs> he did. He said, yeah. prophecy over these bones and say to them, oh, dry bones, hear the word of the eternal. Thus said the eternal God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live again. I will lay sinews upon you and cover you with flesh and form skin over you. And I will put breath into you and you shall live again. And you shall know that I am the eternal. Okay, excellent. And so God tells them it's time to speak the words. Usually prophets, right, when they go speak to people, they're usually, you know, living. That's you know, how this works. It's hard to hear if you're dead uh, and if you're a bunch of bones. So usually a prophet prophesies to the living uh, people. So here it's very different. It's actually going to speak the words of God to bones, right? To people who are long gone. Uh, and we're going to see what's going to happen. And God says what, you know, what's going to happen is we're going to actually recreate people, right? We're going to rebuild a human being. We're going to get the, the sinews. We're going to get the muscles. We're going to get all that good stuff, all the internals, uh, and then cover them with skin and flesh and all that other good stuff. And literally, they get the breath, right? The breath of life. You know, God's going to breathe into them that breath of life. And then they're going to stand up again, right? Uh, so the, we see that. Uh, well, we'll come back to some of the symbolism here as we keep going. Let's just keep reading the, uh, you know, the, the portion itself here. Um, Debbie, you want to pick up from my prophesies? I prophesied <clears throat> as I had been commanded. And while I was prophesying, suddenly there was a sound of rattling and the bones came together, bone to matching bone. Mm -hmm. I looked and there were sinews on them and flesh had grown and skin had formed over them, but there was no breath in them. Then God said to me, prophecy to the breath, prophecy. O mortal, say to the breath, 
Thus said the eternal God, come all breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live again. I prophesied as God commanded me, the breath entered them and they came to life and stir up on their feet a vast multitude. Okay, excellent, right, right there is good. So it works, right? And so now these people are up and they're standing again uh, and they're alive. Uh, so bones that were once dead uh, you know, long dead from what all we can tell, right, are now up again and they are breathing and living once again. Is this any reference to like reincarnation? Uh, reincarnation? Uh, I know it's not in our faith, but like... Actually, reincarnation does hit in our faith a few times, uh, but it's another R word, another big R word. Resurrection, yeah, resurrection of the dead. What uh, Jesus we're talking did. about here. Yeah, exactly. A little bit for the Christian community, certainly, uh, but also for us, obviously, we're going to talk about the idea of the resurrection of the dead. When we do the Givurot, right? It's Mechaye Hakol in the Reform movement. The earlier text is Mechaye Meitim, right? The God who gives life to the dead, who brings life to the dead, because there's an idea not only take it from Ezekiel, but from other works uh, as well, that when it comes to the end times, the end of days, God is going to lift us all up. God's going to resurrect uh, the dead. And God is going to then judge, you know, the final day of judgment, uh, judge all those who lived on earth. And so we have an idea here of not only spiritual resurrection, but an actual physical resurrection. You know, the idea that the dead can live uh, again, uh, by the will of God. Far out. <laughs> yeah, it, it's very different, right? Because in the Reform Movement in particular, we don't use this theology uh, very often. That's why the Reform Movement changed the Givurot, you know, that prayer I just mentioned, when it says, you know, Atagi Borle Lam Adonai Mechaye Hakol Ata Rav Hoshia, right? So God is the one who's going to again give life to all as opposed to giving life to the dead, Mechem team. There was a, a change because the reform movement was uncomfortable with um, adding the theology of uh, physical resurrection into the service. And so they wanted to edit that out and using a more neutral Mechei Hakol, the God who gives life to all, right? Because that can include, if you want, Mechei Meitim, life to the dead. But it doesn't have to mean that, as opposed to Mechei Meitim, which, you know, does mean that. Uh, so... Uh, it's, it's certainly very different. So Ezekiel's going to give us um, a, a precursor, in a way, to that theology, to the theology of a, a physical resurrection, which, of course, then the Christian community is going to use as well about eh, 500 plus years later, a little more, when it comes to their guy, you know, uh, the big J uh, coming back. They're going to have some uh, textual proof, so to speak, that this can happen, that people who are dead can come back to life, right? And so that is part of what we see here is a uh, more more than an illusion. It's a, it's pretty straightforward, you know, with the idea that physical resurrection is a possibility. A God who works outside of nature. You know, we discussed that idea before. The idea of the supernatural deity, the God who can do anything, who's not bound by the laws of nature and of science and whatever it is. God can give life to the dead to the long dead in this case, again, because they're dry bones rattling around there uh, in the wilderness. It's not like they were just dead yesterday, so to speak. You know, these are long, and we're gonna get to that in a minute as well, but you know, these are people who have been gone for a long time and God has now caused these bones to rise. So if we step away from the physical, you know, resurrection piece of it, in terms of theology, uh, we can move on a little forward uh, to uh, what this actually means for Ezekiel, right? Because this is now a vision, remember. This is a, um, a vision that he is having. So he is being taken from where he is and being shown this site and taking part in this site, you know, a little teleportation magic. Uh, so God has taken him to this, uh, this valley, and now we're going to have a message, right? Because now it's all a symbol. It's going to be a message. Uh, Sandy. Uh, you want to pick up over here. Hold on, I'm going to scroll down a little bit for you so it's a little easier. Sure. Uh, and God said to me. Okay. And God said to me, O oh, mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up. Our hope is gone. We are doomed. Prophecy therefore, and, prophecy, therefore, and say to them, 
Thus said the eternal God, I am going to open your graves and lift you out of the graves. O oh, my people, and bring you to the land of Israel. You shall know, O oh, my people, that I am the eternal, when I have opened your graves and lifted you out of your graves. I will put breath into you, and you shall live again, and I will set you upon the Then you shall know that I, the eternal, that the eternal have spoken and have acted the eternal okay excellent so what's that sound interference yeah just a little bit that happens with these calls once in a while you get a little bit of static a little bit of feedback uh, <sighs> so, okay so this is now not only about physical resurrection you know for ezekiel for ezekiel it is about metaphor right it is a metaphor for the whole household of Israel. Because remember, this is now, uh, you know, in the time of exile, right, where the Israelites are uh, in Babylon. Hold on for one second. I'm just going to see. Uh, hold on. See whether this helps the static for now. I apologize. I want to see. I feel like we're probably getting a lot from other, other sources, other backgrounds right now. Uh, so, we have the idea here uh, that it is not about the redemption or the resurrection of the individual. It's about the redemption, the resurrection of a nation. It's about Israel. So God is going to take the entire house of Israel, who for in the, in the prophet's imagination, maybe even, even in their own imagination, are dead and gone in, in a way. Okay, They're suffering. They're in exile. Who knows the future is going to hold for them. But God is going to redeem the people who are, again, ke'ilu, as if they were dead. And God's going to lift them up out of exile and bring them back uh, to uh, their land. So it becomes a passage about hope and about optimism and things that looked really bad, you know, looked really extreme and really terrible and really horrific. Even that God can turn around. In fact, not, not only can God turn it around, but God will turn it around and God will tell the people, you know, it looks bad, but there's going to be a time coming, coming soon where you're going to be lifted out basically from uh, a house of mourning and be brought into a house of celebration, back to a house of praise, a house of blessing, when I bring you back to your land. And then, of course, rebuild, right? Rebuild the temple. So uh, this is a message that sounds a little grisly uh, you know, at first because it's about bones everywhere, uh, but it really is about hope and optimism in the future. The idea that a situation that looks terrible can be made better, uh, and that God is going to, again, make, make the situation better uh, for the people, that God is going to renew and reinvigorate uh, the people, give them new life, new breath, which I think is a tremendous message, because the Israelites, you know, and throughout the Jewish history, we've had these moments of catastrophe, uh, and where it seems like we could be, uh, you know, forgotten about, in a way, but God doesn't let that happen. God helps, you know, renew and restore us and revitalize us uh, again for the next generation. Uh, so it's a pretty, pretty powerful, I think pretty poignant words here. Excuse now, me, Rabbi, but what in the heck was going on in, in Babylon at this time? Why are we there? Uh, so we're, we're in Babylon because they came in and they destroyed the temple in 586 and took us out in chains uh, oh. and, and took the best and the brightest uh, really most of the community uh, into Babylon, uh, raised uh, the city, raised the temple, uh, left everyone dead, uh, either dead in exile or starving. Okay, so, is this is this the second destruction then? First. The, the first, okay. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. First destruction. No, sure. The first destruction of the temple. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, that, that's, that, that's the backdrop here. And Ezekiel himself is probably writing this from exile. Uh, we get a sense that he might be going back and forth a little bit, uh, but you know, he might be literally writing this in exile. Okay, thank you. No, oh, sure. Let me just see here. I'm gonna see if I can unmute a little bit, if that's okay. And just sort of see if we resolve some of that static. And then you can certainly mute yourself if you'd like. Uh, but I'm going to see if I can unmute a little bit, you know. If you, if you want to unmute yourself, you can. First. So okay. I'm, Go I ahead, would, David. 
Yeah, can you hear me? Okay. I was saying maybe we can take a little hope in this current uh, mess that we're in that we'll come out of the valley and, um, you know, we'll maybe not go to new land, but we'll at least uh, recover, you know, our society. Yeah, I'm, I think that's definitely in this, right? And that, that idea that, that things can look bleak, but there's hope for the future. And certainly the idea of those who are feeling, if not, you know, not physically, but maybe emotionally and, and, and spiritually drained and sort of, you know, feel uh, isolated and lonely, that there's a time of, of reconnection, right? Uh, again, of... Um, of, I like revitalization, honestly, because you're getting that life restored back to you. Uh, and that we'll go back to that in a way. We'll go back to what life was before this thing. Maybe a little changed, but a life uh, nonetheless. I have a question. That, yeah. This business that I will set you upon your own soil, do the current, well, maybe the Zionists and certainly the current, you know, idea of, of coming, resettling Israel, is, do they use Ezekiel, these clauses that I will set you upon as some sort of prophecy that we're now experiencing? Look at you, ahead of the curve. Definitely true. This, was, was, this passage was used extensively in the 1940s uh, and, and earlier in terms of early Zionist, um, actually that would be later, but, but you know, probably 1900s even, to use this text. Uh, to help inspire uh, those who were thinking about coming to Israel uh, to, re be, to rebuild uh, a state. So yes, th th this piece was definitely used by the early um, Chalutzim, the early uh, pioneers, the Zionists who were coming early, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, and resettling and rebuilding uh, and, and replanting uh, in the land of Israel, certainly. Very good. Now, a question comes up, what does this have to do with Passover? Because we read it on Chol HaMaleid Passover. So what, what is Passover about this text? I, I read something today that mentioned, and I don't know the times exactly, all the different years, but I read something that when they were leaving Egypt during uh, Passover, uh, that they took Joseph's bones with them. Mm. Yeah. So we have a bone connection, so to speak, uh, that Joseph, uh, his last command to his, uh, to his children upon, uh, you know, uh, you know that, that he's going to die and to his people is that he wants his bones uh, carried with him, carry, carried with them, take them out of, of Egypt. Well, it's... There's yeah. also next year in Jerusalem. Next year um, in Jerusalem. We're going to get back there, right? Yeah. Next year in Jerusalem. Yeah, indeed. Uh, there is something to, uh, actually, we have some commentary we'll get to before I bury the lead too much. Uh, but we'll see this over here. This is uh, a part of the Talmud. This is the Babylonian Talmud, Megillah 31a. Uh, sorry, this is Mishnah. Sorry, it's the Mishnah of the Megillah. Uh, uh, right here, uh, where it talks about different scrolls and other sort of things related to holidays and festivals. And so it has a little passage here. Let's see here. Brahms, you want to give it a read? Yes. <laughs> yes, she does. Rav Luna said that Rob said when Shabbat occurs on one of the intermediate days of a festival, whether on Passover or on Sukkot, they read the Torah portion of See, you say to me, as it includes the Hawah of the festivals and the intermediate days. They read the Haftorah on Passover from the portion of the dry bones, which portrays redemption from servitude. And on Sukkot they read, and it shall come to pass on that day when God shall come, which speaks of the future redemption. Okay, very nice. Clear as crystal? What is Gog? <laughs> We're going to get to Gog in a few minutes. Uh, okay. Our, our, our friend Gog is going to come up later. Um, okay. That's a good one. Believe me, that, that's a very good question. Who is Gog? Um, so he doesn't come up very often uh, in, in what we do, uh, nor should he. Uh, so this um, 
piece of mission here. It just shows you, because again, to me, that this is one of the things I love about Judaism the most, is that we have this blend of the ancient and the modern, right? And so we read that Haftarah from Ezekiel, the dry bones Haftarah, during Chol HaMaled, uh Passover, right? And the reason why we do it is because the rabbis you know, wanted us to do this 2,000 years ago. You know, like this Mishnah was written first century, second century CE at the latest in terms of being written down, uh, in terms of being a tradition, maybe even prior to this. But we have this that early, you know, that we have, to have services on Shabbat, we're going to read this Haftarah portion on Passover. So they give you an explanation, and the Torah portion itself they give you, of course, uh, as well, since it's a special Torah portion, because it includes the calendar, it includes uh, you know, how the calendar breaks down in this Torah portion, one of the couple places it does that. But then it gives you the Haftarah, which we're more you know, focused on, obviously. And so the reason why we read it on Passover, according to the rabbis, is that because it portrays the redemption from servitude. And so just as these bones come back to life, uh, so do uh, the Israelites from uh, their Babylonian bondage or the Babylonian suffering to redemption 50 uh, years later, 536, during the time of the, uh, the Persian kingdom, when the Persian empire comes and knocks off the Babylonians, and then the Persians come in and they rule and they send all of the Jews who want to, they send them home. They say, hey, you want to go home, rebuild the temple? Go ahead, be our guest. We don't really need you here. We're good. If you want to go back, you can. If you want to stay, that's fine too. Uh, and so some of them stayed, some of them left. And so just as the Dry Bones narrative, uh, the Dry Bones prophecy foretells the time when the Jews will escape from servitude, escape from bondage, that's why we connect to the Passover, when they're escaping the original bondage, so to speak. Uh, in Egypt, right? Because the Egypt narrative, remember, that's the the one everything else is built upon, or right? the Exodus from Egypt story. We were slaves, and now we were free. And we keep calling back to the Exodus narrative throughout Jewish history. The idea of remember what God did for you when we were did for us, right? When we were in the land uh, of Egypt, right? The redemption. So we start with Passover, and we move to Shavuot. We go from slavery to freedom and freedom to, to Torah, right, to uh, the covenant. And so it's all part of that same, um, that huge chunk in Jewish time, Jewish values, Jewish history. Uh, and the Babylonian one then is seen as an extension of, we were slaves to Pharaoh, and now we are, you know, in servitude to another kingdom, to another king. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, you know, the rest of the Babylonian empire. Uh, and, and eventually there'll be a redemption from that. Uh, and then it leads into, as uh, the Megillah uh, reading says, to the next reading uh, of Gog and about the final future redemption, the idea that eventually there'll be a final battle, right? Good versus evil, you know, and it's going to be a huge war, and eventually the good guys are going to win. Hooray for everybody. Uh, and then the world, as we know, it comes to a conclusion. <laughs> it comes to an end. Is that uh, Arm yeah. Armageddon? Is that, that Armageddon? Armageddon, indeed, yes. Ar Armageddon from uh, the Hebrew, uh, for the mountain of Megiddo, where the battle is supposed to take place. Uh, and so you have Har Megiddo, and Har Megiddo becomes Armageddon. Uh, oh. In terms of the, uh, how the language develops. So that's why we have the word Armageddon, is from the Hebrew mountain of Har Megiddo. Uh, which part of the scriptures was that with Armageddon? Uh, so we have it in, in this vision over here for Ezekiel. It's going to be coming up in a, in a minute. Uh, and a couple other the prophets also mention uh, different kinds of apocalypse scenarios. So I, you have Isaiah's apocalypse. You have, uh, I believe in Zechariah, you have an apocalypse. Um, I have to think about it. Those, those are the big three that come to mind. And then in future rabbinic literature, you get more about end of days, uh, you know, the, in the field of eschatology, the study of the end times. Uh, so it, and each religion has one, you know, each religion has a, what's going to happen when time ends? Because each faith tradition has the belief and the understanding that time has a beginning, right? Bereshit bara, God creates the world. So there is a point where time, at least for us, for hum human time, right? 
earthly time begins. And so everything that has a beginning that is not God has to have an end. And so eventually, you know, according to this perspective, right, to this theology, there has to be a time when things... <clears throat> Uh, and for us, it's the messianic times, right? The Messiah comes, and in the world as we know it changes. Now, what makes it different in each movement is how, in Judaism, I'm saying now, is how we approach that idea. How much weight do we give it? In no, uh, in no denomination, to be honest, I think is it given uh, a really heavy weight, except for perhaps in the Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox uh, theology when it comes to the idea of Messiah. Uh, because they believe more uh, uniformly in the idea of a physical Messiah coming down to, you know, redeem uh, the people. Whereas in the reform and conservative movements, that's less uh, of a uniform belief. Are we all in agreement as to what good and evil is and where evil comes from? And I mean, uh, who's all? <laughs> uh, all the Jews, all the covenant no. people. No. <laughs> No, that, that, that makes it so much fun. Because <laughs> everyone agreed, what fun would that be? We wouldn't get to argue as much. Uh, I mean, there, there's a definite understanding of good being uh, related to God, right? And, and, and God's commandments and mitzvot and et cetera, et cetera. But again, because there's a differentiation of belief in what that actually means, right? That's the big division right between the denominations is how we understand the idea of Torah and mitzvot. Are they divine commandments that we have to be followed in a very strict way, literally uh, from in their understanding, though it's, I don't think it's correct understanding, but from their understanding, uh, 1800, 2000, 3000, 4000 years ago, unchanged? Or do we have a more modern perspective that, you know, Jewish law is created by Jews? You know, uh, and Jewish law is, is something that has been malleable uh, through time, and uh, we look at, at Jewish law in a more progressive uh, way, and so that's where the disagreement in, uh, in uh, what is good uh, and what is not good uh, would come into play, because we have differing definitions of what it means to live uh, an ideal Jewish life. Can I go? So is there a, Hello? Can I is, there a is there a last judgment in Judaism? Yep. That's part of it at Armageddon? Yep. Okay. Yeah, we, we get them both. Okay. Uh, but again, that's why I mentioned in the reform movement and you know conservative movement, these things don't come up very often uh, in, in terms of the things that we're worrying about. You get a little, you get a little smidgen of it uh, during the high holidays. You get a little taste of it. Uh, talk about day of judgment uh, and the idea of there being maybe a final day uh, of judgment in the prayer book. So you just get you get a tiny little taste of it. Uh, maybe during the high holidays. That's it. Can you can you hear me? Can I hear you? Hello. I can hear somebody. Oh, there's Jan. How you doing? All right. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, I want to go back when David said because of the yeah. Exodus and going to the land of Canaan. Sure. Relating to the current situation, there are many people who psychologically and philosophically feel that we're going to new we're going to go into a different and newer and more humane world for everybody around us rather than what we've been living in yeah yeah that the the vision of the end times is actually positive for us so i think that um you know we want to see a new land and a new way and get rid of the uh you know hate and prejudice that has been going on for so long. Yeah, that is the ideal vision. And we're actually going to see that a little bit in Ezekiel uh, of what the end looks like. Because the end looks like, um, you know, the, the lion, you know, laying down with the lamb, the, the baby with his hand in the serpent hole, right, in the, in the serpent's nest, and doesn't get bitten. Uh, the idea that even, again, once again, the laws of nature become uh, subject to divine will, that the things that would normally happen don't happen anymore, and that it's a, a world of complete and utter shalom. It's a world of peace, it's a world of love, a world of good vibes, uh, and, and that's the ideal, that's the vision, that's the dream, uh, that we're going to get to a point where it's utopia, 
right? It's this idealistic uh, world. Now, a theological point of contention is whether or not, you know, we're going to be sitting here waiting for, for God to do that and, you know, sending Elijah down on a donkey uh, with, a, with a horn, you know, letting us know when the Messiah is coming, or do we ourselves as human beings through tikkun olam, you know, work to create that world ourselves? Or is it a partnership? And, you know, I think the answer is usually partnership, in my opinion. But, you know, that's one, one rabbi's opinion, uh, that it's a, a partnership uh, that we have to help bring it about uh, ourselves. You know, to get back to the beginning, remember yeah. there was the, I don't know if it's an Israeli cartoon series, and it was called Dry Bones. Oh, yeah? I think I know what you're talking about, actually, now, cause now that you're saying it, yeah. It's a, a comic strip, right? Yes. Yeah. I'll have to give that a Google uh, later on. That's really good. That's really good. Uh, so we have here a little bit from Yitzi Horowitz, you know, a little uh, modern, more modern uh, philosopher uh, and, and teacher. And so he's going to give us a little bit here, another another reading, another teaching here. Uh, anyone want to read who hasn't read yet? Uh, why do we read this on Shabbat? Yeah. Kol Hamod Pesach. Yeah. Yes. Testify that we have an oral tradition that the resurrection of the dead will occur in the month of Nisan, but this only explains why it should be read during Nisan. Why on Pesach? The people we resurrected with the dew of Torah, since we start praying for dew on Pesach. It is appropriate to read about the resurrection as well. Thank you. And so Yitzi brings us back, right, to the idea of physical resurrection. And that according to tradition, when we have the physical resurrection of the dead, when everyone is going to uh, stand up and be judged and be, be counted, uh, that this is going to happen during the month of Nisan. Okay, fine. Month of Nisan, why not? It can be any hour of the month. It's the month of Nisan, sure. Uh, but why during Nisan? Uh, why on Pesach? So if you tuned in on Friday night, uh, you know, to our services or to any services, uh, and they went through the Amida, the Avot and Givurot, uh, during the Givurot, there is a seasonal interpolation that comes after the first line. Right? And so that comes in, and that's for half the year, right? Uh, the one who uh, who uh, returns you know, the rains and the winds, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that that comes in. It's a prayer for rain. So that stops after the first day of Passover. So the the the, the liturgy changes to Morid Hatal, the one who brings forth the dew. You can see why I'm not a cantor. Uh, he brings forth uh, the dew, right? So that's. What Yitzi is now uh, connecting this to this idea that during this season we change from the Mashiv Haruach uh, liturgy to the Morid Hatal because this is now the dew that we are praying for during this time of year. And this dew is going to connect to the dew of resurrection, right? That God is going to you know, sprinkle down this dew and bring us all up. Who was the first Jew resurrected according to the Midrash? I don't know. So, no. And it's not Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> if you had that one, that's not right. That Jesus. would be easy. Jesus was sucking. The first Jew who's resurrected, according to a Midrashic tradition, is Isaac. Uh, Isaac gets resurrected because, according to a Midrashic tradition, in the story of the Akeda, where Abraham almost sacrifices Isaac. There's a Midrash that says Abraham actually sacrifices Isaac, and then God brings him back uh, from the dead. Uh, wow. and God resurrects him, and then that's when Abraham kills uh, the ram. It's afterwards, after Isaac had been sacrificed and brought back. Uh, and so there is a history uh, from a Midrashic standpoint, and he's resurrected, I mentioned it, from the dew of resurrection, you know, and then he, he stands up again, and he's fine. A little traumatized, one would imagine, but he's fine. <laughs> uh, yeah, also, the dry bones, you know, sort of says there's no life. But yeah. the fact that God can make life and we can make life 
on a dry bones is very hopeful. It's very hopeful, 100%. Yeah, that it's very hopeful. The idea that even in such this scenario being so terrible, there is still even then hope, uh, which I think, you know, going back to, um, which we're talking a little bit about the, this uh, being used in early Zionist literature and, uh, and Zionist, um, you know, pamphlets, a lot of other good stuff. What's the Israel's national anthem? Atikva, right? You know, the hope, uh, because it is hope that has defined uh, in, in many ways, the Jewish people for thousands of years. There's uh, even when things are looking really uh, not so great, uh, there is still that that light, that spark of hope that remains within us. Yeah. From an archaeological point of view, you can ask uh, Joan Keller and myself, because if you find bones, they reveal what the life was like when their bones were living. Indeed, they do. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and uh, so then they can they, they reveal a lot, right? About about the history and culture. A lot of things can be can be discovered, right? Through the study. This is actually one of my professors uh, way back when. Uh, feels like way back when, at least. Uh, Dahlia Marx, uh, who is a professor of liturgy uh, at HUC in Jerusalem now. Uh, when when I was uh, you know a student of hers. She was actually still, I think, a TA at that point. I don't think she was even ordained yet. Uh, but now she is ordained, and she is a professor of, the, of, um, of liturgy uh, in HUC Israel uh, right now. Uh, uh, an Israeli, fantastic, passionate teacher of Torah, midrashist, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we have Dahlia, uh, who's going to let us know, uh, why do we read the prophecy of dry bones on Passover? If the story of Passover speaks of God's mighty hand, this prophetic reading speaks about God's spirit. And indeed, for us to be a free people, Passover, the festival of freedom, requires more of us than military or physical strength. Maybe this is why the prophecy is recited annually in the central memorial ceremony for the Holocaust at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem and in many other memorial services. It reminds us that sometimes heroism is Givurat Haruach, the heroism of the spirit. Uh, and so the bones are there, but you also need the spirit as well, right? That breath uh, of life, that revitalization. And so Dahlia connects, uh, you know, connects Passover uh, with this idea of the, the renewal of the spirit, because the Jewish people need to have more than just the physical might. You know, God's the one who redeems them out of Egypt. But they need spiritual might, spiritual energy, spiritual strength uh, for the whole journey. Uh, and so I think that's a really nice connection. One uh, last little Pesach connection that we didn't mention yet, uh, I'll throw it out there, doesn't tell us who these bones are, right? Right. So that they're there for a long time. We don't really know what they're doing there. How did they get there? You know, there's no, it's funny how Jan mentioned about learning about the bones by studying them. You know, so there's no, you know, CSI here. There's no forensic team to tell us, you know, where these bones even came from. So, of course, there's commentary upon commentary about who, you know, these bones were when they were alive. And uh, Rashi, you know, oh, so before I even get to Rashi, uh, there is a teaching uh, that says that they're, they're talking about this. Uh, text in the yeshiva, right? And they're talking about it and they're debating amongst themselves. Is it a parable? Did it really happen? Blah, 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 blah. And one of the rabbis stands up and says, it's not a parable. It 100% happened. And I know this. They, they, were, they got the breath of life breathed into them. Then they got up and they, they got dressed. And then they went out and they got jobs, you know, and they worked in the world and they married and they had kids. And I should know, I am a descendant of the ones of the dry bones. So I love that Midrash, that idea that he, he believed that he was a descendant of the dry bones people in the wilderness. But Rashi gives us another explanation. Uh, our sages said that these bones were from the members of the tribe of Ephraim that left Egypt before the God decreed end time and they were killed by the men of Gath who had been born in the land of Israel in the land of Israel, uh, as it is said in Chronicles. So this is an obscure passage, to say the least. But the idea here is that in Chronicles, it tells a little story. You, you, you blink and you miss it. Uh, a little story about these people who 
before the exodus from Egypt, they did their own exodus. They left by themselves and they left Egypt uh, and they were going to sort of like settle, uh, get their cattle uh, all straightened out. So they were going, getting all their affairs in order and then they were butchered. Uh, they were killed by these Philistines uh, in, in, in Gath. Uh, and so it's actually taken, so they were not redeemed, right? They were not part of the Exodus from Egypt. They died before it happened. And so now we're looking at this text, which comes you know, much later, obviously, in Jewish history. If you want to take the Exodus to, you know, I can't really date it, but 1500 maybe, I think is, is one of the dates given, maybe a little earlier uh, uh, from Egypt, a little later, I'm sorry, later than that. Uh, no, no, how about, let's call it 1500 for now, from, until I Google it later. Uh, but the idea is that these people are waiting, right? They're waiting dead and gone in the wilderness for a thousand years to be redeemed. And finally, with Ezekiel, they get their exodus moment. They get their redemption because they blew it the first time. They left too soon. They didn't wait for God. And they went out and they got killed. Uh, but now through the vision of Ezekiel and through the parable of dry bones and through the prophecy, they get their exodus too. Good things come to those who wait, even if it's a really, really long time. They still get their exodus, which I think is really sweet in a bizarre way. Uh, that they, you know, missed their chance. They they messed it up the first time, but there's always a hope for a second time. Even if they, you know, were in a situation where they would have no hope, God makes it so. You know, God is able to create hope for the hopeless uh, and and give life to the lifeless, both physically and uh, emotionally and spiritually. Which I think again is a beautiful Passover message. Myself, I think that. Um... This emphasizes that God decreed that the whole Exodus is about all the powers of God, and these yes. people didn't have the power of God given to them. No, yeah, they didn't have it. That's actually why, um, ironically enough, in a way, that you have some of the, you know, once or twice a year you get this in the news even today, where you have the uh, these ultra-Orthodox sects who don't believe in the state of Israel, uh, and they, they actually, they are verbally uh, abusive and they sort of like boycott and, you know, they stir up, you know, stuff against Israel because they believe that we shouldn't be there yet because God hasn't decreed it. God hasn't brought us back, you know, uh, to the land. We did it. And, you know, as human beings, we created a land of Israel. Now, one can, of course, argue the theology and whether or not that, you know, the people who started the Zionist movement were God-inspired. Uh, and certainly there were many religious Zionists who came uh, you know, into the fold uh, after the secular Zionists started the movement. Uh, but uh, they say, no, you know, we, we don't accept Israel because God didn't make it so. So they're actually Jewish people you know, in the ultra-Orthodox movement uh, that uh, sometimes are, are relatively viscerally anti-Israel, uh, which, again, is, is always surprising. Anyone ever see that in the papers, you know, uh, whatever? Yeah, you know, these people they go they go to Iran. You know, they sometimes are like is this Israel Day parade. You sometimes see some Jews boycotting against Israel, and it's those people, you know, uh, that are there. So every, every Jew seems to have his own opinion, right? Or every group. Indeed, they do, but it, it, it comes to that this one. It comes from that theological point that God has not ordained the time yet, right? And when God ordains the time, that's when we go back to Israel. Uh, you know, not not before. And so these uh, these guys here, these members of the tribe of Ephraim, they leave. You know, they, they do their own exodus, they, even though God hasn't commanded it, and it doesn't end well uh, for them. It's actually a similar theme to this uh, week's Torah portion as well. You have to stay tuned for Friday for that. Uh, okay, so that is our Rashi text. That's our dry bones text. We're a little bit in between because in between, it's only 7.50, uh, but it's a little late to start Gagu Magag here. But we'll begin it anyway, uh, because... It's fun to say Gagu Magag, uh, no, nothing else. Okay, so this is Ezekiel 38, uh, 39, Ezekiel's Apocalypse. Uh, David, you want to start this over here? The word of the Eternal came to me, O mortal, turn your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, modern, modern day Turkey. Prophesy against him and say, Thus said the eternal God, Lo, I am coming to deal with you, O God, chief 
chief prince of Meshech and Tuval. I will turn you around and put ho hooks in your jaws and lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in splendor, a vast assembly, all of them with bucklers and shields, wielding swords. Okay, so quick note as we get started. Gog didn't exist. Gog's not a person. Uh, Gog is a symbol. Uh, if you think of uh, Amalek uh, in a way you know, that we have uh, as well, the idea of uh, a Jewish supervillain. Every hero needs a villain or else there's no point. Uh, so you mm -hmm. need to have a bad guy. You can't have good without bad or bad without good, according to at least the classical theism. You need to have uh, some kind of dynamic, some kind of fight, uh, some kind of dualism. So we have Gog here, uh, who is, uh, again, the, the, the land seems to be around Turkey, as we'll see in a minute. It's not just Turkey. Uh, there's going to be other places as well to get added to this. So Ezekiel's going to go prophesy to Gog uh, and, and tell him that uh, God's going to get you, basically. God's going to come deal with him. And God's going to hook him like a fish, right? God's going to rip him out of the water and leave him wriggling and whatever it's going to be. Uh, and so they are going to come and they're going to fight against the Israelites. This is a prediction, a vision, a prophecy, as we would say, about what the end of times might look like, according to at least Ezekiel's vision. Because they're not going to have this big apocalyptic battle, right? It's going to happen between the forces of evil, uh, personified by Gog. And the uh, good guys, of course, us, right? So we're going to have this army of Gog that's going to come down, and the Gog is going to bring us friends. Do you think yeah. this, the, the, the Ben-Gurion and the people who founded Israel in the Haganah yeah. speak of this, that they're going to come back, and if they have to, militarily take over and reclaim Israel? Yeah. Ben-Gurion, you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, 48, you're talking about? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And so they come in there and they reclaim and conquer, conquer the land. Uh, okay, we've got some more uh, uh, text here. Uh, Jan, actually, you want to give that a read, Jan? Among them shall be Persia, Nubia, Sudan, and Ethiopia, and Put, Libya, everyone with shield and helmet, Gomer, nomadic tribe in Asia Minor, and all its cohorts, Beth Toganama. Eastern Asia Minor, the remotest part of the north, all its cohorts that many peoples you few. Be ready, prepare yourselves, you and all the battalions muster about you and hold yourself in reserve for them. After a long time, you shall be summoned in the distant future. You shall march against the land, restored from the sword, gathered from the midst of many people. Against the mountains of Israel, which have long lain desolate. Pete liberated from the nations and now all dwellings secure, you shall advance coming like a stone. You shall be like a cloud covering the earth, you and all your core hosts and the many peoples with you. So, you know, that's really powerful stuff. You took a step back. So he's talking about a time after, right, the Israelite redemption because all the prophets, right, envision a time when Israel is going to be brought back to the land and we'll have a state, you know, and they're going to be dwelling in, uh, in safety and security, everyone under their own vine and fig tree, right, with none to make them afraid. So that's already happened, according to this vision, or at least what's going to happen now is after that. So all the Israelites have been gathered, regathered. Uh, to Israel. There's no more galut. There's no more exile, right? We're all going to be gathered back into Israel, and we're going to be dwelling in safety and security. We're going to be rescued, plucked from other nations where we're not safe, and all gathered together, returning uh, to the land of Israel uh, in that vision, dwelling securely until Gog gets aroused, gets, gets riled up, right? to go fight against the Jewish people, to go fight against the Israelites who have already been redeemed. If you have a map handy, uh, and if not, that's okay, uh, but you can do this later. Take a look at some of these countries, right, if you have it in your head. So Israel's being attacked basically in this vision from all sides, right? So if you have north, south, east, you know, they're all sort of like coming around to attack, all coming into uh, and fighting against the, uh, the Israelite state. 
uh, from, from Africa, from Asia, you know, from uh, Arabia. They're all sort of coming. Arabia's coming a little later, but they're all coming uh, to, to fight uh, in this battle. Sounds like what happened in 48 when the entire it, Arab world around it attacked Israel. Indeed, it does sound like, like, like 48. That's exactly right. Another reason why this uh, this works on multi levels. Okay. Okay. Let's see here. Okay, Leah, you want to give us a read? Sure. Thus said the Eternal God: On that day, a thought will occur to you, and you will conceive a wicked design. You will say, I will invade a land of open towns. I will fall upon a tranquil people living secure, all of them living in unwalled towns and lacking bars and gates in order to take spoil and seize plunder, to turn your hand against repopulated wastes and against a people gathered from among nations, acquiring livestock and possessions, living at the center of the earth. Sheba, southwest Saudi Arabia, and Dedan, northwest Saudi Arabia, and the merchants and all the magnates of Tarshish, southern Spain, will say to you, have you come to take spoil? Is it to seize plunder that you assembled your hordes to carry off silver and gold, to make off with livestock and goods, to gather an immense booty? Okay, we'll stop right there. So you actually, this goes back to the question you asked before, Leah, about uh, the definitions of you know good and evil. I think that we would certainly say that the idea of invading and attacking uh, a people, right, uh, who are not ready or prepared to defend themselves, right, who are not even, they're living in, again, they're living in their utopian society. They're secure, there's no walls, there's no gates. Uh, it's just everyone's uh, so pathetic. Everyone's feeling really good, really happy. And now they're gonna come and burn it down. They're gonna come to kill everybody uh, and to seize uh, the spoil because they think that they can't defend themselves. You know, Gog would think that the Israelites can't defend themselves. So there's gonna be uh, this huge war uh, that's gonna happen uh, afterwards. But why would God put them up to it? Why would God put them up to it? Yeah, he says a thought's gonna occur to you. Oh, he's just predicting the future. God, God is warning. God is warning Gog of what's going to happen. I and, see. Uh, you can you can uh, warn people about their future. It doesn't mean that they can't not going to try to fulfill it anyway, right? Or, or not try to change the narrative. Uh, okay. And so that, that's yeah, that, that's a good point though. Is that and because God is often used in these as a, a motivator or something that pushes things forward, uh, and, and so that makes sense uh, to look at it that way. But here it's more of a predictive. Uh, this okay. is what's going to happen in the future. It's a it's a warning uh, to them. <laughs> It seems like when he said wicked design, he's making a, um, a metaphor of what happened if you do this is wicked. Yeah. Yeah. It's like you're going to have this bad thought in your head, and it's not a good thought, and it's not going to end well. And, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but not in the way that the Gog would, uh, would think, right? And so, again, it's that it's stern divine warning. It's a shaky finger uh, that we have here. That's really good. Let's see. Let's see what we got. Sandy, you want to pick up over here, therefore? Prophecy, O mortal, and say to Gog, thus said the eternal God, surely on that day when my people Israel are living secure, you will take note, and you will come from your home in the farthest north, you and many peoples with you, all of them mounted on horses, a vast horde, a mighty army, and you will advance upon my people Israel like a cloud covering the earth. This shall happen on that distant day. I will bring you to my land that the nations may know me when, before their eyes, I manifest my holiness through you, O oh God. O oh God, indeed. That's actually a good place to stop. That's sort of a good stopping point for us. Because what does this remind us of? The holiday we're in now, Passover, what does God say? That God makes known God's glory, right, through Pharaoh, through Egypt. God's strength, God's wonders, God's power is going to be known through the Egyptians because it's the Egyptians who he's slapping around. Uh, you know, it's through these ten plagues. The Egyptians are going to know that God is God. And more importantly, the Israelites are going to know 
that God is God when God comes to redeem the people from Egypt through signs and wonders and miracles and transports them, takes them out of a land that is not uh, you know, theirs and brings them to a land which God will show them and that God has picked out for them going back to the time of Abraham, right? And so again, the language, the metaphor uh, is consistent. This idea that God is going to make uh, you know, God's power manifest through signs and wonders. You know, God is the anti-God? God is the anti-God. God will be the anti-something else in other theologies. I think that sort of a funny metaphor is Tivia, as in the musical, looks up at God and said, why did you wait 400 years? Yeah. Why did you wait 400 years? It took a little while right, to get it done. Uh, but we got there. That was the prophecy of 400 years, and that's what it was. Um, but yeah, so it, it's really, I think, again, really powerful. The idea is that uh, this idea of God being at our sides and God's going to help us through the difficult, uh, perilous times. And when it seems like there is no hope, uh, there's still room for faith. There's still room for belief. There's still room for uh, the idea that eventually things will get better, even in the darkest times, whether it's dry bones, you know, getting new uh, skin and, and new breath in, in the wilderness, or whether it's a people surrounded by uh, an army, you know, people who, uh, who want to do them harm, but still, you know, prevailing, uh, you know, uh, even when all it could be in doubt. They still prevail and survive. Am Yisrael, Chai and Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach, everybody. We're going to continue with Pirkei Avot in about two minutes. Uh, if those who want to stay, Pirkei Avot uh, is the ethics of our fathers, uh, though it's gonna, it has a different translation. And we're going to uh, sort of study some uh, Jewish ethics and some commentary uh, on this really important text, probably the most quoted of all rabbinic texts is Pirkei Avot. So if a rabbi, you know, say, you know, gives a sermon, Pirkei Avot's, you know, in there often enough. So we're going to take a look at some Pirkei Avot when we take a little breath. Let me see here if I can do a different view. Uh, let's see who else has joined us. I'm going to stop sharing this for a minute. Uh, we're going to get to the other thing soon. I see Karen's here. I see Gary's here. I'm still here, I think. Yeah, I'm we're still there. Yeah, yeah. You're, no, you're still here. Leah's still here. Debbie. Sandy and Jen. Polly. Excellent. Okay. Oh. This is what I've learned. Matzah and goat cheese go together really well. Can't have crackers, so you use some matzo instead. And a little bit of honey, beautiful. And a little bit of got some gluten-free honey. It's a nice break from all the briskets and all the other meats. You got to go dairy a little bit too for during Passover. Can I just ask you a quick question? Sure. If dry bones can be resurrected, can ashes be resurrected too? According to um, Jewish theology, sure. Okay. Uh, only and you, know, you remember that you know, this, the idea of resurrection, uh, by definition, is supernatural. And so if, if, if bones can be resurrected and live again, so can ashes uh, you know, as well. You know, God, God isn't in a box when it comes to this. God can do that too. The uh, prescription against um, against uh, um, you know, burning one's body you know, against cremation uh, comes from Leviticus. You know, it's the idea that we're not supposed to destroy uh, and and defile a body, and then it got extra symbolism after the Holocaust. Uh, but in the uh, 21st century, there's certainly a greater move towards cremation. Speaking of um, the ashes, is that why? Uh, this reform conservative approve of cremation so the ashes could still become alive? Well, so, uh, uh, approve is a tricky word. Uh, I, I would say that the reform and conservative movement have become 
uh, more accepting of, uh, more, more, more uh, understanding and tolerant of uh, cremation, especially in the reform movement, even now alluded in the conservative too, uh, for, for many reasons, uh, with the idea again, with uh, resurrection not being confined to bones, but the, the greater issue was the idea of, uh, of the, hal the halachic prohibition uh, of not destroying the body. So it had less to do with the resurrection and more to do with just not destroying the body. But after the, um, the Takana in the 20th century, late 20th century, from the Orthodox movement about organ donation, uh, a lot mm -hmm. of that, that theology uh, progressed a little bit because there was a while where the Orthodox would not donate uh, organs after death because they believe that God wants us to read whole, so to speak. That's, that's why you have, uh, you know, those, those things in place that no, no autopsy, no this, no that, with the idea that God wants us to be buried as soon as possible. And, uh, you know, the law states us to be buried complete. Uh, you know, for, so when we have physical resurrection, we have all of our, our parts. And then the Orthodox finally came around and said, look, it's pekuach nefesh, it's saving a life. If you can save someone's life by being an organ donor, you do that. Uh, and then, you know, God's going to take care of the rest. God's not going to resurrect you, you know, and, and you don't have a, a, a kidney or a lung or, or a heart or whatever it is. God's going to take care of that. If God can do all these other miracles, God can give you a new heart. If God, if you need a new heart in the afterlife. Uh, and so once the Orthodox figure that out, you know, there's a greater movement towards the Orthodox becoming organ donors. So that circles us back to cremation, which is still a bridge too far for the Orthodox, but it becomes, a, again, a similar idea that resurrection uh, of the body, if one wants to believe in the the resurrection of the dead, you're going to get it if you're cremated or you're buried. You know, God can do it. God can figure it out, you know, uh, at that point. Okay. Yeah. Love it. Little theology. It's always good. Okay. So we're going to now look at Pirkei Avot. So um, you know, for those who just joined, you know, Pirkei Avot uh, it translates uh, most commonly to the chapters of the fathers, the ethics of the fathers. It's probably a mistranslation uh, of the title and of the author's intent, uh, where the word Av is most commonly translated as father, you know, Av, Abba. You know, but Av also has a different definition uh, in rabbinic Judaism, meaning uh, first principles, uh, meaning ethics. Uh, and so this literally probably translates to the chapters uh, of the ethics, right? The chapters of how to be a good person, of, of ethical living. Uh, Pirkei Avot appears in the Mishnah uh, first, so it's oral Torah. So we're talking about second century CE. Uh, where the Israelites uh, are going to compile through the work of Judah Hanasi, uh, who is the a redactor, uh, the editor of the Mishnah. And so this is being passed down orally, according to tradition, from generation to generation. They decided now was the time to write it down. Why? Rome. Rome's going to come in and kill everybody. So they figured, you know, we better write stuff down or else it's going to be lost. If Rome comes in and kills everybody, you know, it's going to be lost forever. We better write it down first or else it's going to be gone for good. So they decide around second century CE to start writing all of this down into six different orders, six different tractates of the Mishnah broken down by, by subject. And there is a, a part of that that's called Pirkei Avot, which is the ethics of the fathers. This has seven chapters to it. And there are coincidentally seven weeks between Passover and Shavuot. And so according to tradition, every single week during Passover to Shavuot, as we count the Omer, we also read a chapter of Pirkei Avot. That way, when we get to the Shavuot uh, time, we've completed the whole book. Uh, and so we're going to do chapter one, or at least part of chapter one uh, this evening for our study, uh, because I think it's a great teacher of Jewish values uh, and Jewish ethics. And as I said, we're gonna go through this one and you'll see a couple, uh, couple of our big hits in here, some of uh, the favorites of the Jewish community. Some of this sound a little bit familiar. So we're gonna begin with Pirkei Avot 1, uh, 1, because what better place to begin than the beginning? Mm -hmm. uh, so Pirkei Avot chapter one, uh, verse, uh, sorry, uh, you know, passage one, uh, 
David, you want to give that a read? Moses received. I don't see anything except people. Oh, sorry. Nope, that's me. I'm so excited to begin. I didn't even get us going here. Sorry. There you go. There we go. Now we're cooking with gas. All right. One, one. Let's start at the very beginning. Yes. Moses received the Torah at Sinai and tr transmitted it to Joshua. Joshua to the elders and the elders to the prophets and the prophets to the men of the great assembly. They said three things, be patient in the administration of justice, raise many disciples, and make a fence round the Torah. Okay, very good. We could probably spend the next 50 minutes just on that. Uh, so we're gonna, we're gonna dive into that a little bit right now. Uh, what is this uh, passage, at least the first uh, sentence, let's break it down by sentence. The first sentence about Moses receiving the Torah, blah, blah, blah. What's that telling us? started at um, Mount Sinai and then this is how it got here today because it went from you know from Tinker's Tavers to Chance you know one 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 place after another it's it kept tra being transmitted. You gotta go around the horn exactly right so it, it begins at the beginning right so Moses gets it at Sinai Moses gives it to Joshua etc etc it gets passed down the line there is uh, right from the beginning of Pirkei Avot, they want to give you one of the most important and consequential uh, values or statements in Jewish theology, that this all goes back to Moses. It all goes back to Sinai. It all goes back to Revelation, right, uh, at Sinai. So Moses gets it all directly, right, from God. Then he takes all that good stuff and gives it to Joshua, who then gives it to the elders, and the elders give it to the prophets. The prophets give it to the men of the great assembly who did not exist. Uh, and so, you know, at least in terms of in, in, that, uh, in that name, right? But there's an idea of an unbroken chain of tradition going from Moses all the way to, guess who? The rabbis! Because the rabbis get it as well. Then once the rabbis get it, they can then create with it, right, as well. And they can say it all goes back to Sinai. It all goes back to Moses. So you have mitzvot de oraita, the mitzvot that come from Torah, and mitzvot de rabbanan, the mitzvot that come from the rabbis, but they both come from Torah anyway, and then not from Torah to God, right? So it's God given all the way through, from God to Moses to Joshua, etc., etc., all the way down to the rabbis of today, God willing. Okay. So that's really good, an unbroken chain of tradition. Uh, and then they say three things, be patient in the administration of justice, fair enough, raise many disciples, always good to teach people and have them learn something, and asu siyag le Torah, make a fence around the Torah. What does that possibly mean? The ark? The ark, yeah. Checking it? No. no. Was it? Not physical, though. So, I, I, was the, um, I would say something else. Who, who's that? Holly. Uh, picking the, Holly. Uh, yeah, I, I would say, meaning leave it as it is and study from that and, and do something and like they've done, they've made writings other places and, and but they've left the Torah intact. I think that's good also. Like, I think the constitution in the Smithsonian is in a place that nobody can get to it. Yeah. So it's a safe, it's a safe, it makes it safe and it can't, it, it, the, the people around it, you know, can't make changes to it. That's really good. That's really good. They're all really good interpretations. Uh, what, it, what it means is uh, no chicken Parmesan is what it means, actually. <laughs> no chicken parm. I don't know what that means. I'll tell you. That's no, right. no meat and milk. <laughs> obey the law. No meat and milk. Yeah. It doesn't mean obey the law. It means be careful not to transgress any part of the Torah such to the point where there is going to be a space around the Torah. So the Torah is in the middle, right? And now you're going to build a fence around the Torah, and you can't do that stuff inside the fence too. So the reason I give the chicken parm example, okay, so the Torah says – and by the way, debatable that it says this to begin with, but it says, you know, don't bathe the calf in its mother's milk, right? We've all heard that expression, mm -hmm. which is taken to mean by rabbinic authorities, 
no mixing milk and meat, right, at a meal, right? You can't have a cheeseburger. You can't have veal parm, right? Because that is bathing a calf in its mother's milk. Fine. Why can't I have chicken parm? Chicken's meat also. Why? The cheese. Chicken meat? Chicken's meat, but, but, but it has nothing to do with milk. Chicken doesn't they just, eat milk. They just extend it. Bingo. They just extend it. Because the idea is that if I go to Joey's New York restaurant or Alfano's, one of these other places, and have a nice, delicious chicken Alfredo or chicken Parmesan, and I bite into it, oh, and it's delicious. What am I going to think? If that's good, veal Parmesan must be even better. Okay? So now I've been tempted by the chicken and milk. So now I'm going to have the beef and milk. So in, in order to not have the beef and the milk, we take out the chicken and the milk too. That way you won't even be tempted to do it. Jewish modesty rules, right? So we have rules about, you know, it, it, that govern the exchanges between men and women. Has anyone heard of kol isha before? The love kol isha? Kol isha means that if you're a man in the Orthodox tradition, you can't hear another woman sing, right? You can't hear them raise their voice in song. That's why you have mechitza, and the men go on one side, the women go on the other side, right? And so why can't we hear the women sing? Men, why can't we do that? Bad thoughts. Why? Because they're, <laughs> they're going to distract us, men. and they're going to enchant us, and they're going to take <laughs> us away from God. If we hear the melodious voices, it's going to be a distraction, and then it's going to make us break sexual boundaries and sexual laws. So because we can't have, you know, illicit adulterous relationships, we can't hear them sing either, because the singing could lead to other things. That's why you wear a wig. Like the sex? From the, sacred to the, from the sacred to the profane, right? What? From the sacred to the profane. From the sacred to the profane. If you're gonna, you know, show, you know, your your hair in public, maybe you'll show other things in public too, uh, and that leads down to a bad road. So you have to have that fence around the Torah, the 613 commandments, right, and everything else that is going to be custom, which then becomes law in a way. Because the custom, it's, that's an amazing, in terms of the progression of Jewish life, how custom, how quickly custom becomes law in a blink, right? Uh, I think, um, Jan, you're the one who referenced uh, Fiddler on the Roof, right? So they have that scene at the wedding, right? When uh, when Mottle and Cycle get married, uh, right? And uh, then uh, Perchik wants to dance with Huddle. Uh, and he's, no, he can't dance with a woman, whatever it is. And they ask the rabbi. And what does the rabbi say? It's not exactly forbidden, right? Because there's this idea, the siag, the fence around the Torah. But Huddle can dance with Perchik, and it's not a sin. It's not forbidden. So they all dance until the pogrom happens and ruins the happy story. But you know, that's exactly the idea, though, is that we have these things that become law from a sense of custom, that you don't want to break the Torah law, so we're going to have other rules in place to make sure that you don't even break those. So, you know, if you can't break this law, that's not even a law, you're not going to actually break the real law. Build that fence around the Torah. Now, someone in the very beginning mentioned the physical, you know, actual fencing, which is actually mm -hmm. partially right, because the idea is that it's actually built upon the system of the tabernacle, that you have the idea of the Torahs in the middle, then you have an outer box, and another outer box, and another outer box. It keeps getting bigger until everyone can come in to the outer outskirts, and it's only the high priest, right? It's only the Kohen HaGadol, so the, uh, who can enter into the Holy of Holies one day a year on Yom Kippur when he's asking for atonement for himself and for the people of Israel. Uh, and so just as, as there are fences, there are safeguards from transgressing the holiest that's in the middle, they take that idea and expand it philosophically, theologically, and say, look, this is going to be the law. This is going to be Torah. Uh, but we want to make sure you don't mess that up. So we're going to create more laws to make sure that you don't even get there, right? We're going to put another fence, the electrified fence, so you don't get mauled by the lion. The singing of the women reminded me of the sirens in the Odyssey, where Odysseus has to yes. tie up to the pole did not be seduced by the sirens. Indeed, misogyny exists in all cultures. 
I have a question. Have a question. This yeah. says um, make a fence around the Torah. Yeah. In some of the older um, synagogues, uh, like the one in, in Prague, they literally, the the um, bima, uh, the ark, it's all in the center yeah. um, and enclosed, uh, sort of an offense type of thing. But we've gotten away from that, I guess, now, right? Or do they still have it in, se in Sephardic? They still have it in some places. Um, but but you know, that's more, I think, in an older Sephardic uh, kind of, of synagogues. But in Orthodox synagogues, you might have the Amud in the middle, oh, which actually, I actually like that model, the, uh, the Amud, the, uh, the, the stand in the middle. Uh, you know, of it. Uh, it's very communal uh, with that, that idea. Uh, okay, so as I told you, we can spend a lot of time on build the fence around the Torah. Uh, this, yeah? I have a question. In sure. uh, Hasidic communities, they, they have a like a wire in every room. Yeah, they Does it come from the same, same uh, idea of building the fence? The same sort of idea of uh, but, but but done in a different way, yeah. Because the idea with the Eruv is that it creates that sacred space within. That way you can do certain things that you can't do outside the Eruv. So yeah, it, 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 it does have a, a similar idea from it. Uh -huh. sure. Yeah, uh, of having an Eruv, uh, creating a space that is separate from the profane uh, and that you can, again, do those certain things. You can carry your towel within the Eruv, you know, but you can't carry your towel out of the Eruv. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's building a fence so that Torah can be uh, done within it. Yeah, okay. really good. Uh, we got have a little passage here from our friend Rabbeinu Yona, uh, Jonah Abraham, uh, Jonah Ben Abraham Garondi, a 13th century a Spanish scholar. He writes a running commentary on Pirkei Avot. Uh, there are a few uh, really good running commentaries on Pirkei Avot that literally go, you know, part by part uh, throughout. Uh, we're going to study two or three of them, uh, you know, today. Uh, and Rabbeinu Yona uh, is one of the more popular yeah, ones. And he's going to give a, a interpretation of this uh, idea of transmission. So we've touched upon it already. Uh, so we can sort of go through a little bit, uh, a little quicker, uh, since we discussed it already. So, you know, it gives the idea of Moses receives the Torah from Sinai and gives it to Joshua. But, and this is a big part of the, again, theology, is that Moses doesn't only get Torah. Moses gets oral Torah as well. Moses gets Mishnah uh, according to tradition. There's also beliefs that Moses gets everything. Moses gets, uh, you know, Torah. He gets Tanakh. He gets Mishnah. He gets Talmud. He gets Midrash. He gets Zohar. He gets codes. He gets everything all in one blast. That way no one can say later that they're doing something outside of what Moses knew. Uh, Moses gets everything at once, right? And that way all can be from God, from that one source, that one time, that one big blast, that one big bolt of revelation uh, at Sinai. And so the reason why they need this is the Torah is given uh, at Sinai, but it's given with nation. Because if it were not so, it would be possible to understand its contents. So it gives you an example. It's written, do not rob, right in Leviticus. Uh, and so all the laws of damages are within this commandment. Uh, and they themselves are the Torah that was received at Sinai, even though it's not written. So it's taking that step back. It's like the, the, the chicken parm example that I gave, but I'll give another uh, different example of, it says in Exodus, right? Uh, the Ten Commandments, you're going to rest on Shabbat. Fine. What does that mean, to rest on Shabbat? It doesn't tell you. You get a little bit here, a little bit there, but don't, uh, don't kindle a fire, right? Uh, you know, don't, but it doesn't give you too much more. Like, don't do your plowing in the field. But it doesn't give you, well, what does it actually mean to rest? And so the Mishnah, the oral Torah, is going to come and fill in all of that gap and say, okay, don't uh, do any work on Shabbat. means don't do one of these 39 different uh, classifications of work. And we're going to take those 39 classifications, and we're going to make them another 39, another 100, another 200, so all the way to today, so we can argue about the halakha of, you know, setting your Instapot on Friday night uh, for, uh, for Saturday afternoon, and whether or not that's okay or not. Interesting. I think this has a lot to do with today in our Supreme Court, with justices like Scalise that said that, you know, they read the Constitution as the final law and not an oral Torah, so the interpretation of the Second Amendment so we're stuck with people who are 
reading the Torah verbatim and others who are, you know, seeing the oral Torah? I would say that if you made a Venn diagram, uh, there is a lot of overlap between constitutional literalists and biblical literalists. Uh, that, that, that's, those, those circles are pretty well overlapping uh, for the most part. Uh, I think that has been my experience at any rate. Um, and so, yes, that, that gets certainly true. Those who see Torah, Jewish law, Bible, uh, in the Christian community too, you know, you know, are these things living documents or are they the unchanging word of God? Do we have the idea of being able to interpret and reinterpret, uh, you know, these words according to modern day values? Do they help inform modern day values? Or is it supposed to be stagnant? It's supposed to be... Um, unchanging. And I think you get the same thing, obviously, with uh, constitutional law, uh, but, you know, between people who think it's supposed to be how it was in you know, the 1800s versus 21, you know, 21st century uh, is what I meant. So that, that's what this, uh, this portion basically gives you, this whole thing here, is the idea that the oral Torah is also given to Moses. That way, when we have these different laws that come out in the Mishnah and the Talmud, no one can say, hey, you know, you, you made that up. You know, you're making us switch plates for no reason. You know, you're making us not drive my, you know, my, my uh, Toyota Corolla, you know, uh, on Shabbat for no reason. Because they know it goes back to Moses at Mount Sinai, which is how you can't uh, use your elevator on Shabbat. I think you and I could have quite a discussion on that, Rabbi, but it's probably not, you know, um, what you had intended for this um, <laughs> lesson. Well, remember, this is Orthodox opinion. This is not my opinion. <laughs> and before you yell at me. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, it's also the evangelical Christians, you know. Yeah. The Bible says this is good and this is bad. Yes, that's right. It, it's more black and white, whereas in the modern perspective, it goes to shades of gray. Uh, you know, but, but certainly in, in a more evangelical, again, biblical literalist perception uh, of it, it's, it's more unchanging. Uh, but the idea, again, being it helps justify the theology of saying that it's God-inspired or, again, God-divine-written, divine word, right? And that, that's what uh, gives authority uh, as it, it continues. And you can say that the authority goes back to Moses and to God. You can justify creating law in a different way. And that's saying, well, it's not me. It's a my interpretation. That's what God wants, uh, which then leads to uh, perhaps troubles down the road as well, uh, certainly. Okay. Let's pop over to a uh, one three uh, here. Uh, Gary, you want to give us a read? Okay. Uh, Antigonos, man of uh, Soho, received from Shimon the righteous. He would say, do not be as servants who are serving the master in order to receive a reward. Rather, as servants who are serving the master, not in order to receive a reward. And may the fear of heaven be upon you. Okay, I, I stuck with fear here, uh, which is a translation. I could have just as easily translated this as awe or reverence. Uh, I think the commentators that, that, that we're going to look at like the uh, more literal translation of fear, but if it was Rabbi Lobel translating it, I would have written awe uh, or reverence uh, and not fear uh, in this context. That's just my little PSA uh, as we continue this reading. Uh, that that word fear can be different things. Uh, but uh, even in the 20th century and even today, uh, you have people who do believe uh, in uh, not only the Jewish community, but Yerat HaShemayim, you know, the, the fear of heaven being actual, you know, fear and trembling, uh, but certainly the conservative movements, it puts the fear of God in you, right? Uh, where it has the idea of God being, you know, a, a punishing deity or there being, uh, you know, reason to be afraid right? Uh, and that's not my theology, uh, but that is certainly uh, apparent in other theologies as well. So I just wanted to, again, put that out there as a, a little PSA. So we have here the idea of um, that we should be serving God, right? And again, the language is hierarchical and it is a paternalistic little top down, but that's, you know, classical theology. Don't be as servants who are serving the master as in God, on the condition to receive a reward, meaning what? Don't do mitzvot because it's going to get you into heaven, right? That's not why we should be doing mitzvot, because we think it's going to lead us to the big, uh, the big steakhouse in the sky, 
uh, as I say, okay? So that, that's not what we're supposed to be doing or thinking about. Rather, we serve uh, not thinking about a reward, right? We serve because why do we serve? It's our job, sure. right? Wow. It's, our, it's what we're supposed to be doing. It's why we were created in a way. It's the right thing, uh, however you want to frame it. Uh, that that's why we do good things. We do mitzvot because it's the right thing to do. It's what we were meant to do. It's what we were created to do is to do good, to do uh, right in the world, according to this interpretation. Uh, and a little bit, little coda, you know, with all that said, let the fear of heaven be upon you, you know, or, or have a healthy respect, maybe, and healthy respect for uh, the divine could be a, 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 a lighter way of putting it. Mm -hmm. So our friend Bartonura comes in, of and Abraham of Bartonura, uh, 15th century Italy. Uh, in the original Italian, it's better. Uh, but anyway, I'm just kidding. I don't know Italian. Uh, <laughs> and may the fear of heaven be upon you. He wrote in Hebrew anyway. Uh, Even though you serve out of love, also serve out of fear. So he wants you to do both, right? For the, the one who serves out of love. Question, does it? Well, it doesn't say we can't question, though, does it? No, it doesn't say we, we, we don't question. Questioning is fine. Uh, we, we like to question a lot. I think okay. the question is, is that um, you can question, but where does the question lead you? I don't know. That's why you asked the question. Yeah, I, 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 think, I think that, no, but what I'm saying is that's the, a theological difference, is that mm -hmm. in the reform movement, we question with the idea of coming out with maybe different answers than in the Orthodox movement. So the example mm -hmm. I, I could give is say that um, one of my favorite uh, bits of halakha uh, comes from the story of Jacob uh, wrestling the angel, right? And, and Jacob wrestles the angel and, you know, he's wrestling him for a blessing, you know, and bless me, blah, 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 blah. But during this struggle, what happens to Jacob? He gets hurt. Hmm? He gets hurt. He gets hurt. What happens to him? How does he get hurt? His thigh. His thigh, right? His hip. And so the, the angel, in blessing him, giving him a, phys, uh, a uh, spiritual upgrade, gives him a physical disability. He wrenches his hip, and Jacob from then on walks with a limp. You know, uh, though according to a midrash, he's healed by an angel afterwards. That's another Torah study. But the idea is he gets hurt, right? He is not the same. He is transformed in more than one way, right? So he is now transformed. He is now Israel, the one who wrestles between, you know, with, with divine beings uh, and is successful. So he is Israel, but now he also is infirmed. He is also injured. He is also hurt at the same time. So the cause of this spectacular story and moment and, and, and writing. What is the halakha that comes from that story? No pain, no gain. That too. <laughs> Goes back to food once again. No <laughs> filet mignon. Because <laughs> filet mignon contains the sciatic nerve. Uh, you know, so you cannot eat, according to Jewish tradition, that nerve because it is holy. Because it is the nerve that Jacob got wrenched when he fought with the angel. So the halakha comes there, to, which means that you, you can't, it's like in a kosher butcher, you can't get filet mignon because it's very expensive to sort of do that process. It's not worth the time and the money and the energy to do it. So you can't go to a kosher steakhouse and get a filet mignon. It's an unkosher cut of meat. Can't do it. So that is ridiculous for all of our meat lovers because you know, steak is delicious and a filet mignon is delicious. And what does that have to do with Jacob, his hip. his hip hurt. Absolutely nothing. So an Orthodox rabbi actually wrote about this. He wrote about saying, this is stupid. You know, uh, you, why are we doing this? You know, and not why, this is stupid. It has nothing to do with Jacob. Don't eat filet mignon. So even though they question it, right, even though they say that's a ridiculous halachic opinion, they'll question it, but they're still going to do it. <laughs> afterwards because they'll say will of god you know that's what god wants us to do I'm not gonna eat it you know even if the, the the reasoning doesn't make sense to me because it's not supposed to make sense to you in the reform movement we don't like that at all reform jews i'm speaking more generally are rationalists we're pragmatists we like to sort of know why we're doing things we're gonna do the mitzvot 
but we'd like to know why. We'd like to have it make sense to us. Not everybody, not in all circumstances. I'm speaking again very generally. But we like to know why. We like to question. Why are we lighting the candles on Shabbat? Why are we, you know, uh, doing, uh, why are we eating matzah, you know, for seven days or eight days? Why are we doing this and not that? And if we like the reason, we'll do the mitzvah. If we don't like the reason or we don't think it's meaningful, meh. It's not so important to us. We don't really need it. Yeah, do something else. It's fine. I'll find another mitzvah I like better. Right? So that's what we have because, again, generally speaking, we are belonging to a rationalist post enlightenment influenced movement uh, that we like to question. And then that question will dictate our response, perhaps in a different way than it would in the Orthodox movement. So we can. Another take on the Jacob and the disability is sure. after that wrestle with a part of God, he now has something every day to remind him of what went on then and what he has to do in the future. 100%. It is a reminder. It is a literal battle scar that reminds him of what he went through. And put, even putting it in a different way, and I know some of you will appreciate this as well, who work in, you know, in, in these different fields, pain, you know, growth comes through pain often enough. You know, growth is not easy. Transformation is not easy. It takes effort. It takes work. And it, it, it can be, again, we, we go through a lot of stress and strain to get to a better place. And we're not going to get there unless we put in the work, and the, which, again, can, can be taxing physically, can be taxing emotionally. But you put in the work and you get to the better place and you become transformed. It doesn't become, you know, it's, it's not easy. It's, it's, I think that's part of the story as well. So he's going to have that reminder with him forever that he went through this great struggle, this great battle, uh, and this great battle with himself, right, and, and God to become the man, to become the person uh, that he uh, is meant to be. And it doesn't happen overnight. It happens through pain <laughs> sometimes and struggle and hard work, generally speaking. But I think that, that that's a good lesson from there uh, as well. So going back to serving out of love and fear, you know, why does Bart Nura want, want you to do both? Uh, because for one who serves out of love is quick concerning a positive commandment. Oh, I, I, I'd love to, to light the candles. Oh, I, I'd love to wave the lulav. Oh, I'd love to do this. And it's exciting and it's fun. But one who serves about fear uh, with fear is nervous with the negative commandments. I can't do this or, right? I can't do this or. I'm going to get the divine zets across the head, right? <laughs> I, I, that's why I can't do the bad thing because I'm worried about the punishment. So if you have them both, if you love to do the positive commandments and you are worried about the punishment coming from the negative commandments or just one you can say even in a different way, the natural consequences of doing, of, of transgressing a thou shalt not, a negative commandment, you're going to take them both and Judaism, okay, you're going to get them both and you're going to become fully fledged, uh, uh, fully actualized Jewish person and having both of them. That is his uh, interpretation. Again, I would be the one who would get rid of the fear part totally, uh, because I think love is it should be enough. But that is just again my my opinion. I also think that the pain, if you look at the pain of childbirth, delivery, and after trauma and after surgery, you know you have to go to the pain to get to a better place and rewarded and you know and have you know peace again. Mm, that sounds really good. I like that. That's really good. We get to that better place eventually. Um, this one over here is a little redundant to what we talked about. It's nice, but it's a little redundant, and I just wanted to keep going a little bit. Uh, okay, uh, Sandy, you want to take this one over here? Oh, sure. I have the one with the weird name. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it, girl. Yo Yosa ben Yotzer, man of Sreda. And sure. Yo okay. Yosa ben Yochanan, man of Jerusalem, received from him. Yosa ben Yozer says, may your house be a meeting house for sages, become dirty in the dust of their feet and drink their words thirstily. That's just a, a, a thank you, that's just a quick tangent. I love uh, whenever we have the Rabbi Yossi's uh, because in English it's usually transliterated as Jose, you know, with a J. Mm -hmm. uh, and so people will read it and go like, Rabbi Jose says this. And I'm thinking to myself, what do they think they are? <laughs> in the Middle East, not Latin America. 
you know, Rabbi Jose, now there are Rabbi Jose's to be fair, but, uh, but Rabbi, at that point, it would not be Rabbi Jose. That's why I like using the Y, Rabbi Yossi, because that is the actual better, uh, better Hebrew. It's where you get those J sounds in the Latin and other places for our words, uh, because that's, you know, they, they don't use the, the Y in the same way. Yossi, then Yotzer, uh, sure. And so what does he say? May your house be a meeting place for the sages, become dirty in the dust of their feet, and drink their words thirstily. Enjoy. Enjoy that dusty foot water. So, <laughs> yeah, I have to leave. Bye. On that note, <laughs> that note, <laughs> he's going to leave the gathering house, the virtual gathering house with the sages. Okay, so um, I like this idea. Bart Noor is going to expand upon it in, in a second. Uh, but the idea that, you know, in a non COVID world, uh, that it is nice for us to gather together. Uh, with our teachers, with, with, with scholars, with mentors, with, uh, with learned individuals, and just sit and learn together and, and, and talk words of Torah, speak words you know, uh, of philosophy, uh, of poetry, of music, of art, whatever, on a higher, you know, think of the, uh, the salons you know, in, uh, in Europe, right? We would come and you would all learn together over good wine and good food. Uh, and you would learn, you know, from the scholars of the day and have these great deep conversations and you wouldn't just watch Netflix. Uh, you know, you would have these really deep conversations that would be transformative in their way. So Bardinura, you know, our, our friend from Italy uh, says, Polly, what does he say? May your house be a meeting place for the sages. When the sages wish to gather together or to meet, let your house be ready for this purpose so that they may become accustomed to saying, let us gather at so-and-so's house, for it is not possible that you will not learn some bit of wisdom from them. A little double they, negative. Excellent. <laughs> they stated as allegorically, to what can this be compared? To one who entered a perfumer's house, though he did not purchase anything, and in any case, he soaked up a good scent, and it brought it out with him. I made him sneeze. Where's the sneeze? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no sneezing and, you know, that spreads the particles no sneezing uh, but, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah I, I love the metaphor this idea that uh, it's encouraging people to do what it's not only to be social but to be active learners to be curious uh, it's a nice deal I'm not going to tell you no uh, for the rabbis oh rabbi come to our house or we're going to give you some nice uh, nice food and whatever it is and you'll teach for whatever it is and we'll have a, a learning session oh sure i'll love to go uh and so we, we're going to gather around and we're going to enjoy and what i love about this is that it, it it gives you a couple different levels here one it speaks good for the person right doing the inviting because other people are going to think when they think about your house think oh well, that's where all the wise people go that's where the learners go you know, they don't only go to the yeshiva, you know, but they'll go to your house and we're all going to study together in this intimate setting and through chevrusa, through, through a, a communal joint learning, right? We're going to raise ourselves up to a higher level because it is impossible, they say, impossible that you would be in that setting and not pick up something, okay? You don't have to have the greatest mind in the world, right? But you're going to learn something by being there, okay? You know, it, it could be a fire hose pointing at a thimble, right? But it doesn't matter. You're still going to catch something uh, of, of what's going on. Uh, and if you have a, a bigger pot, as my professor would say, a bigger pot, you get a lot, as my professor always said. And we talked about Maimonides, different class. But anyway, this idea is you, you're going to gain some kind of wisdom, some kind of knowledge by just being in the room with a great scholar. Uh, and so it's the same as if you go into a perfume shop. You might not buy the whole thing. You know, you might not buy the whole, um, you know, the, the, whole, the, the expensive high end of perfume. Uh, but you're going to leave ah, smelling sweet uh, anyway. All think, yeah. thing in the air, through osmosis, thing, thing, all around you, you're going to get some of the good stuff. That reminds me, as a kid, I, we, across the alley was a bakery. Mm. You <laughs> smell the bakery, even another one down on the, on the road, and you, you get the experience of the bakery without buying everything. Yeah, unfortunately, I, I didn't hear that second part of that sentence. I think, you know, I grew up behind a bakery, and you always smell the morning when they were making donuts and bread, and so you can 
visualize and taste the bread and donuts without buying them. No, I, I would buy them. That's the whole problem. That, 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 that would, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm walking by this thing going, you know, for me, you know, certainly bakeries, you know, uh, would, would do it back in my youth. But coming from the great state of Texas the past five years, it passed those barbecue shops. Mm. Oh, and smell that in the air, bring a tear to the eye. Uh, and then you have to just keep walking, keep walking past it and not get a brisket sandwich to go. Yeah, mm -hmm. do a little jog, do a little run past uh, the barbecue shop. Uh, the reach nikoach, you know, the, the, the sweet smell, the savory smell to the eternal. Uh, exactly right. Uh, and so the idea is come and let's learn uh, together. And through the learning, through the uh, creation, which is why another part of this, of course, is the creation of that welcoming, uh, in inclusive area, right? We're all going to learn together. We're going to study and we're all going to gain some wisdom and gain some knowledge together. So I think it's really a, a really cool way of looking at it. What is the reason for that negative sentence structure? Is that a direct translation from Hebrew? Yeah, Hebrew is just weird. Uh, okay. Sometimes with that. Uh, you know, so it, it, they're trying to be rhetorical, you know, using a rhetorical device. So it's just awkwardly worded in the English. Uh, okay. it's to, to say indeed, yeah. Russian uh, believes in, I don't know, not German, but Russian believes in negatives and you can never have enough negatives. Never have enough negatives. That sounds well, I believe that. Right, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> Russian believes that. Yeah. You can, you can negate it till you're blue in the face. Blue in the face. <laughs> uh, well, Karen, how about you take this next one over here, Yehoshua? Uh, okay, Yehoshua Ben... Perakia and Nitei, Nitai of Arbel received from them. Yeshua ben Perakia says, make for yourself a mentor, acquire for yourself a friend, and judge every person as meritorious. Oh, thank you. Very nice. So, you know, you'll see, and we saw this in the first passage as well, that rabbis like to deal in threes. Uh, you know, for whatever reason, uh, threes become big in other faith traditions too. There's something psychologically very comforting about the three. Uh, I don't know the exact reason behind it, but there's something very comforting for people when things come in threes. And then it becomes a bad luck thing too. They always die in threes or whatever it is. Bad things happen in threes. But threes, uh, for some reason, as, as a number itself, it has a mystical component to it as well as a psychological one. So three, uh, make yourself a mentor, get a friend, and judge every person as meritorious. So what does it mean to acquire a friend? This was much longer, so that's redacted a little bit for us for the sake of time and energy. Uh, acquire for yourself a friend. So what does that mean? Well, we need three things, haha, -ha, three once again, from a good friend. One is four, words of Torah, easy enough. I have learned much from my teachers and more from my friends than from my teachers. So the idea being that you can learn from a friend, you know, Torah uh, just as, 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 or even more so you know, then from maybe from a rabbi is that you can sort of learn uh, a lot from rabbis and learn even more from friends. Makes sense. So we, someone who's going to help us learn, help us become wise, help us to grow. I think it's a really important element, a good component of friendship. The second is for the idea of the commandments. So we're going to know that this friend, right, is not going to be perfect. It doesn't have to be more pious. And sometimes they're going to screw up. They're going to do things that isn't, uh, aren't correct. And so because of this, you're learning from each other the right way to live because you're both not perfect or right? you're both going to make mistakes. But it, when you're in a relationship with each other, you can help correct each other uh, and you can repent together. Easier to do things with more than one person. It's like going to the gym. Uh, you know, it's good to have a buddy, right? You sort of, you go together, you motivate each other uh, to be better. And the third thing is regarding advice. Uh, the, uh, the friend be one who arouses uh, a counselor for help in all of their affairs and to take good counsel from them and to be a confidant. They don't spread your secrets, okay? So the idea here from uh, Rabbeinu Yonah, right, is that a friend does what? A friend makes us better. A friend helps us achieve uh, growth and helps us uh, achieve uh, self-actualization, uh, which again, I think is a really uh, interesting idea and one that I would argue runs throughout uh, Jewish thought uh, is that we're always striving higher. And what greater role could there be for a friend than to help you in that journey, help you in that struggle, help you become the person, again, you meant you are meant to be. Uh, so I think it's a really wise words from Rabbeinu Yona, uh, why we should you know, acquire for ourselves good friends. Uh, judging everyone as meritorious, uh, you know, this is, um, frankly, a lot of Mishigas. 
but it's okay. Uh, you know, as well. Yeah, this a lot one of music was, in there. Yeah, the, the, this one droned on in there a, a, a little bit, but just the idea that we have to beat it to death. You know, the idea just that when we see someone, uh, you know, doing something that we think might be a little bit askew, if we know them to be a good person, if we know them to be someone of high moral character, then maybe we give them the benefit of the doubt. Not that we don't still question and examine it, but we come at it from a place of okay, maybe it isn't what it seems. And a person with a low sort of moral character uh, and they do something, again, it's the same sort of issue. So we judge from, from past actions. But we try to judge favorably, I think is the greater point. Uh, here we go. They knew, they knew even back then. Uh, Debbie, you want to pick this one up over here? Maya and Aftalion received from them. Shemaya says, love work hate lordship, and do not become familiar with the government. <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah. What does that tell you? So Barton Noor is going to explain that a little bit for us. Love work, easy enough, right? So even if you were a millionaire or a billionaire or whatever it is, even if you have all the money and more that you need to sustain yourself, it's still good to work because idle hands, right? Mm -hmm. Idle just leads to distraction. And so the idea is you're always to be engaged in something, right? Uh, I had a, a teacher of mine who, who, who said, you know, like you can be, because uh, back then the rabbis, you know, like they, they would do that. But they'd also have a lot of other skill sets because they had to constantly be working to support themselves, to uh, sustain themselves. Because they didn't have the same, uh, the job of the rabbi 2,000 years ago was a little bit different than the job is now. Uh, but you'll have to constantly be working, as I'm trying to say here. Hey, pardon, pardon me, but yeah. you know, when I watch the billionaires and millionaires, Warren Buffett, give advice to the young person, almost yeah. all of them says, only do work that you love. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I think that's part of it, right? Is that loving work, but that, that, that's why I'm here and not a doctor, uh, yeah. because I hated science uh, and doing it when I was in school. I hated science is too strong. I was not, I was pre-med bio in college and I was not enjoying it at all. I was taking cell bio, organic chemistry, you know, doing okay, head above water, but, but not enjoying it. It wasn't, it didn't speak to me. It's something that I loved to study. And so what did I love to study? Religion. I love to study philosophy and I love to study theology. And so I, I said to myself one day, you know, I'm not gonna do this anymore in terms of the pre-med stuff. I don't enjoy it. I don't love it. I'm gonna study what I love. And I'm gonna see where it takes me. Yay! Uh, but you know, if not, I'd be you know I don't know what I'd be doing. But you know, with a degree in religious studies. But that being said, uh, you, you study what you love, right? And then you, if you love what you do, you know I think it's a little bit trite to say this doesn't feel like work. But there's something obviously you know powerful to the idea of loving what you do uh, and it being a a career. And if we're blessed enough to to have that, because not everyone is. Uh, I, I think it is a blessing to really love what you do day in, day out. Uh, and that's where I think Warren Buffett's coming from, because uh, I would agree. Uh, hate lordship and do not say, I'm a great person and it is a disgrace for me to work. Uh, since Rob said to Rob Kahana, flay a carcass in the market and take your pay and do not say, I am a priest, I'm a great person and the matter is a disgrace to me. Another explanation, hate lordship means distancing yourself from taking uh, authority over the public as lordship buries those who have it. Right, Polly? Right. <laughs> and I'm like, and okay. No, I'm like, so no chiefs and all Indians? I ain't buying that. No, it doesn't work. But, but, but uh, obviously in the extreme uh, sense of it, because so, someone's got to do it, right? Someone has right. To, to be the one in charge. I think they're just, they're worried here. And this is why I would, I would disagree with this a statement really at all, uh, except for the love work. I like the love work part, but the, the next two statements I actually wouldn't agree with in the, in the literal because um, the first part of his translation or his commentary, I do think it's something to the idea of not feeling like you're above grunt work. You right. know, I, I think I agree. Uh, holiness in that, uh, or you know, humility. Excuse me, in that that you know. You shouldn't feel like, you know, oh, well, this, I can't, you know, be bothered to do such a thing because I'm so important. I, I don't think the attitude, uh, you know, it really fits in with the Jewish concept of humility. Uh, but 
the reality is, and, and uh, you know, certainly with a lot of Jewish organizations, I'll let you know uh, that you need to have good relationships with the government. Uh, they are assuming here a malevolent government uh, that will corrupt you uh, if you come, come in contact with it. Uh, that that is their idea because who are they dealing with now? They're dealing with Rome, and they're dealing with empire, and they're dealing with you know people who aren't so friendly with them. So the idea being that you can be friends. Or you can try to be friends with Caesar, right? You can try to be friends with, you know, the leaders of the Ottoman Empire. You can try to be their buddies. But once things go badly, what's going to happen to you as the Jew? It ain't going to go well. Okay? Off with their so, head. Say again? <laughs> Off with their head. Off with their head. Exactly right. Uh, and so I think that's more his caution here. So when I look at it, you know, obviously for me, it's a little bit of a flip because I feel like if the past hundred years has taught us uh, anything when it comes to this idea that the Jewish community needs to be involved uh, mm -hmm. with, the, with the government, needs to be involved with, uh, on all levels, because that's how you get your voice heard. And that's mm -hmm. how you get, uh, you know, uh, you, you give voice to your issues and get support. If you're gone from it and if you're in your secluded little cave, uh, which is what I think they might imagine, to be honest, uh, then things are going to be happening to you uh, as opposed to you know, happening with you. Uh, and so you disempower yourself, in my opinion, if you uh, abstain from being involved uh, in the affairs of state. It's just, again, the question, and Maimonides will double into this as well, that I mentioned the idea that it's going to eventually be corrupting. So the idea of absolute power corrupting absolutely, you know, taking it to a different level, just the idea of any sort of, it's, it, it has a implication that the government, no matter how well-meaning, is going to screw you up uh, if, if you're going to take part in it. It's going to change you, not for the better. It's not going to be transformative in a positive way. It'll make you a worse person and not a better person if you're involved in this stuff. So let other people do it. Not the right attitude, in my humble opinion. Mm -mm. Well, you know, through history, and you know, the old saying, don't put yourself on a pedestal, from the Romans until even World War II, Hitler and Mussolini, the first thing the people do when they beat them is to knock down their statues. Knock down their statues, exactly right. And so I think that's the concern that they have as well, right? And that there's something that is incongruous with leadership and humility, in their opinion, which is difficult because of course, why does Moses, what, what, what's Moses' most lauded trait? His humility, right? So the ideal leader is humble, but that's Moses. And how many Moseses are there, really? Uh, and not the, a lot of us. Not a lot of us. <laughs> so if we think of ourselves as a Moses, you know, that might lead us down a, a rough path. And so I think it's, it's, it's trying to state a self-awareness, a uh, caution, just to be aware uh, of what you're doing and your values, are they uh, aligning with Jewish values? Or are you being corrupted by affairs of state and behaving in ways that you wouldn't normally behave if you were not so involved in, in the government? So I think that's, that's the caution. But again, as a, uh, as a general rule, I think it becomes, again, problematic. Uh, so uh, we, I have 858, and I don't want to skip too much here because we only have two more to go. Uh, but I do want to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, so I'm going to go to the most famous one. Who wants to read the most famous one here? Is that 114? 114. He, Rabbi Hillel, used to say, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? And if I am for myself alone, what am I? And if not now, when? Then yeah. when? Then when. Or when is fine, too. You don't even need the... Uh... That reminds me of the. Uh, there you go. <laughs> okay. That reminds me of the Christian minister that said that I watched them come for the for the uh, the guilty and the criminals, and I watched them come from this, and I watched them come for the Jews. Yeah. And they're coming for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I forget his name, but yeah, it was a. He was a Lutheran. Was yeah, a Lutheran. yeah, a, 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 a Lutheran minister. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, I, I, they, they came for the socialists, they came for the, the this, they came for the that, mm -hmm. uh, the union workers and blah, 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 blah. And then there's no one up left, you know, for me. 
Uh, and yeah, that, that's, that's definitely part of this uh, as well, and which is why this quote is so often used uh, because, and there's a huge commentary here, we're not going to really delve into it. I'll, I'll give you more of a summary. Uh, but if I am not for myself, in ain anili mili, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? So what does that mean? If I don't stand up for myself, how can I stand up for others? Oh, oh, the first part, sure. If I don't stand up for myself, then yeah, but then who else will? You know, it's like if you don't who have self-confidence right. and self-esteem, you know, and whatever it is, if you don't stand up for your own values, you can't ask other people to do so, you know, as well for you. So you're going to get run over. So you have to have some air of self-confidence and be a little bit more, you know, um, self-interested in a positive way, you know, that you have to look out for your own interests. Uh, there are times when that's important, that you have to be your own advocate. That's great. But what happens if you only do that? And I think the second sentence is about selfishness. You're if selfish. I'm just thinking about myself and nobody around me, you know, Bingo. I, that's why. What do you notice uh, for that, that second sentence? Look at the second, the second sen this sentence over here. Look at the second phrase. And uh, what's, what's interesting there, my grammarians? Alone. alone. So if I am for myself alone, what, what, not what am I? Not as opposed to who, who am, am I? I? Right? It's what and instead of a who. Why is that? That's a very purposeful translation. Because uh, that is the correct translation. Uh, so, well, if I, you, if I, yeah. If you substitute who, that's a lot more human. And what? Bingo. And, and so what? That, that's exactly what they're going for. Anything but human. That if you only think for yourself, it is like you're subhuman. It's almost like you're an animal. Because animals are only interested in their. Well, this is a generalization once again, but according to this idea. The animals are interested in their own needs, right? In their own sense of preservation, their own sense of self. Animals, by their nature, are not altruistic. Again, generally speaking, animals. Oh, There's studies. What? There's studies that are proving that not so wrong. No, right. No, that's, what I'm saying. that's what I'm saying. I'm saying this was a belief then. And I think now there's, there's a different take on this. But I'm saying back then, that was sort of the take on it. That was one of the differentiation marks between humans and animals. So you're right that I think nowadays that, that thinking is less, uh, is less true, now that we've studied more about animal behavior. Uh, but the idea back then was that if you only are concerned with your own needs and your own indulgences, then it sort of makes you less than a person. It makes you sort of subhuman in a way that you're almost like a, like a monster, like you know, they're looking at it, right? And that you're just a, a creature uh, of, um, of desire, of want and of need uh, that you're just taking in for yourself and don't care about anybody else. And so you have to be, yes, self-interested. If not for myself, who will be for me? You have to be your own advocate, but you can't only be your own advocate. You have to care about other people, what's going on uh, in the world around you. Uh, so it has this balance, right, of be your own advocate, but also advocate for other people. You have to be involved in the greater community. And of course, imlo akshav, if not now, imatai, when? If not now, when? When are we going to do it? Uh, and the answer, of course, is now. Is we're supposed to do it. Now mm -hmm. is the time. We're not supposed to be patient. We're not supposed to be apathetic. We're supposed to get involved. Akshav, now go and do, uh, go and do the mitzvah. And that's where this commentary is gonna go, uh, you know, is the idea that um, he's gonna, Rabbi Yon is gonna look at it in the, through that lens of commandment, right? That we have to be ourselves, be, um, be committed and, and honest uh, with ourselves and do the commandments, be self-motivated. But sometimes you need a buddy, right? And you need to be involved in the greater world and, and help each other, again, be better and don't wait, <laughs> do it today. Uh, and so I really love that balance of the Hillel quote, uh, without even thinking of the commentary, but it's the Hillel quote, the idea that we need to be, uh, we need to, it's unrealistic, right? There's no person who is 100% altruistic living in the world only for other people, right? You, know, you, you couldn't live you know, that way. You have to be for yourself once in a while too, or else you wouldn't eat. You would just starve to death. You know, that would be it for you. So you have to live for yourself a little bit but you also can't live only for yourself. You have to live for other people uh, and recognize that there's other people around you and not only be self-interested, but be interested in tzedakah and tikkun olam. Uh, and you need to carry, again, carry both with you uh, into the world and, and do that uh, every day.
do it now. Don't don't delay. Any questions? Mm -hmm. And the sheet of the um, the Pirkea vote well, um, paper that there was lots of interesting things on that. Is that something you can email us? Yeah, yeah. I, I've, I've historically, you know, yeah. I'll, I'll definitely I'll, I'll cut and paste it into something that I can, I can send it in. Uh, definitely. Not, there were some very very awesome things in there. <laughs> that's why Pirkea vote. That's that's why it's a go to. Uh, all this stuff, you know. I, I summarized it, but all all this stuff is here. But exactly right. It's it's. That's why it's so popular. That's why the, the, all the songs, you know, all the camp songs were taken from Pure Chaos Vote. They're not all of them, but some of them. Mm. You know, the, um, oh. It's not up to you to complete the work, nor if you to abstain with it. That's Pure Chaos Vote. You know, uh, in a place where there's no person, strive to be a person. That's Pure Chaos Vote. So there's, just, there's a lot of Pure Chaos Vote uh, that's used because I think the uh, the words are, are, are timeless, you know, and you can take a lot from them. And as you saw, you know, we interpret and reinterpret them. Uh, there's some that I left out very purposely because they were, you know, were a little less helpful to, to that point. Uh, but uh, for the most part, it's very, I think it's, it's stuff that you can struggle with, but there's a lot of great teachings uh, as well. So thank you all for studying and for learning together. Thank you. And now, now you all smell even better. Yeah. <laughs> you normally smell my it's perfume. Wafting yes. Perfume. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Have a great rest of your Passover. Talk to uh, We're going to see everybody. Uh, we have services. Don't forget, we have the Yisker services tomorrow. Right. The reminder came out uh, t uh, today. We have a Yisker yeah. service tomorrow. Rabbi Michael Torp and I will be uh, leading uh, the service. Um, and then uh, we have services Friday night. Okay. okay. Thank, thank you, you, Rabbi. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.